Hey, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this Tuesday, April 9th, 2024 edition of Trading Places Live at EarningsBeats.com. I'm Tom Boley, Chief Market Strategist here at EarningsBeats, and I'll be your host for the next 30 minutes or so as we take a look at the pre-market action, see what's going on today. Uh, pretty interesting day. Actually, not so interesting yesterday. It was kind of a boring day. Uh, saw a little upside, a little downside. Market finished bifurcated, so we had some indices up, some indices down. Um, we did see the volatility index, though, uh, drop down more than 5% yesterday. So we did see some uh, stabilization of the market after we saw uh, the selling last week, especially on Thursday afternoon uh, when we had one of the uh, Fed presidents, Minneapolis Fed president, um, Neil Kashkari, uh, talking about the fact that we might not have any rate cuts in 2024. That spooked the market for a couple hours. But it seems like it's been kind of back to business as usual. I will mention that we have a couple of big inflation reports coming up this week. Uh, tomorrow morning, Wednesday morning, we'll get the CPI report out for the month of um, March. And then on Thursday, we'll have the March PPI coming out. So those are a couple of big reports you're going to want to pay attention to, especially the Wednesday report. The CPI report's the one I focus on. I think that's the one that the Fed takes a pretty close look at. And we also want to consider the core CPI. I know a lot of folks thinking inflation is going to take this big tick up because we've got a lot of uh, movement to the upside in energy over the past month or two. That, remember, gets stripped out of the core CPI, food and energy. I know a lot of folks say, well, that's crazy. Food prices are up, way up. Energy prices are way up. It's hurting the consumer. Why do you ignore it? Well, the reason you ignore it is because they're very volatile. I mean, if you look at a long-term chart of energy and crude oil, I mean, if crude oil was the only thing we had to worry about, I mean, prices per gallon or per barrel right now, you could go back many, many years. Uh, in fact, I think it was back in, was it 2007 that we had, um, I think it was crude oil at over $140 or close to $150 a barrel. That was in 2006, 2007, maybe it was 2008, I don't know, somewhere in that time frame. And now we've got it in the mid uh, 80s per barrel. So, you know, yeah, you could say, well, it should be included. But then if it was included, I mean, we would have inflation that would be half or just a little bit more than half of what we had in terms of oil prices uh, going back 15 years or more. So just understand that there's a lot of volatility in the energy space. Um, and so that gets factored out. Same with food. I mean, you can have droughts, you could have things that we can't control that drive prices up. It's not necessarily always about demand supply. The regular demand supply sometimes has to do with things outside our control. And so you're going to get a lot of uh, movement back and forth. I think some of what we've been dealing with has been related to the pandemic. How much of it, I don't know. But really, we should strip those things out in order to get a base um, CPI, at least I feel that way. So I think the way the Fed does it is correct and the way they look at inflation. Um, but, you know, we have seen some issues with inflation over the last few years. Um, we'll see. I mean, maybe we get a tick up. Uh, I believe the core CPI, we're expecting three tenths of 1% rise. And the core PPI on Thursday, I think we're expecting two tenths of 1% rise. And if you look at um, inflation at the producer level, the, the PPI and the core PPI, we're already back in the 2% range, 2 to 3%. So it's not at the producer level that we're still, you know, watching and worrying. It. Well, some are worrying about it. I believe we're continuing to drop on the CPI, and I think we're going to drop right back into the twos. We've been steadily dropping from 6.5%. We're down to 37 I don't think it's going to be too much longer, maybe another three, four months. I believe we're going to be seeing a two-handle on that annual rate of inflation, core inflation uh, at the CPI or at the uh, in, um Consumer level, sorry. Anyhow, um, enough talk about that. Just know that that's coming up. That could uh, certainly in the short term drive prices one way or the other. I mean, the good news is we've seen the volatility index pick up. So the volatility has been there. The fear has been growing. And yet, honestly, we're probably one solid day away from all-time highs again. And we've got futures up this morning, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. But uh, let's take a look first at what happened yesterday. So we got the Dow Jones Industrial Average finishing down 11 points. Um, you know, take a big yawn. S&P 500 down 1.95 points. 
0.04%, another big yawn. Uh, NASDAQ 100 down eight points. That was down 0.05%. Triple yawn. Mid caps actually up 12, 13. Uh, that was up about four tenths of 1%. And small caps up a little bit more than one half of 1%, gaining 1.12 on the IWM back up to 205. 57. So we did see some strength, a little bit of strength in mid caps and small caps. And then the transports uh, rising just under one tenth of 1%. So half the indices I like to follow up, half of them down. Really no big deal, nothing, no big breakouts, no big breakdowns, and volatility dropped. So all in all, it was probably a pretty good day for the bulls just to have that stabilization. Now we haven't gotten back up above the highs from last Thursday when we had the big sell-off. So I certainly wouldn't say that we're out of the woods and with a big CPI report coming out tomorrow, who knows? If that comes in at 0.4% instead of 0.3, is the market going to resume that downfall that it saw last Thursday? It's possible. I mean, we still got a lot of room down, especially on the S&P 500 down to the 50-day moving average. NASDAQ basically has been trading off of its 50-day moving average for the first time since back in early November when we moved above it. Um, the Dow Jones uh, is right about on the 50-day moving average. Finished yesterday at 38,892. 50-day is 38,876. So we were 16 points above the 50-day moving average. So we've kind of drifted sideways for a while, and that's what happens sometimes when you get negative divergences, which we've been dealing with for a while now. I mean, ever since the Dow hit the high back in late December, Every one of those highs since then, you can see the PPO has been lower. Look at the S&P as it's been going up, PPO is going lower. NASDAQ going up, PPO going lower. However, we have now essentially reset. We haven't gotten the, the zero line test on the uh, NASDAQ just yet and on the PPO, but we did get a 50-day test. And these are the two things I look for when I get a negative divergence. I just look for a resetting. It might be a, a top. It could be a major top, but you need, you need corroborating information. I don't ever look at a negative divergence and think, oh my gosh, we're going to have a massive uh, bear market. That's not what I look at is that the, the movement that we saw to the upside early in this rally, and I'm talking about back in November and December, gave way to just a little less um, bullish movement to the upside. We just slowed down. And part of that was because we lost uh, relative strength from technology in some of the key aggressive areas. And that in turn, uh, you know, we saw it move over to more value-oriented areas like industrials, like financials, uh, maybe to some degree, and at some periods, maybe healthcare a little bit, um, staples from time to time, utilities had a good month in, all, um, in March. So those were areas that kind of picked up, but those aren't areas that, are heavily represented in the in the S&P 500. It's more of the technology and consumer discretionary. So um, I think we've had the big run by the aggressive groups followed up by, rather than money leaving the market, money left some of those aggressive areas, went over into some more value oriented areas, and that's kind of held the market up. So I think the next step is what do those aggressive areas do here over the next couple months? Do we see technology you know, some rekindling? Do we see financials and industrials continue to lead for, you know, a period of time? All of that's possible. I will say internet I'm watching closely because the internet does like the month of April. It tends to get started over the next few months, tends to do very well, um, and it has been doing well. So we'll see whether or not that continues. That could be a group that certainly could lead us over the next 30 to 60 days. Um, looking at the sectors, so I put three leading sectors from yesterday on here, which were discretionary, up almost 1%, real estate up close to nine tenths of 1%, utilities up two thirds of 1%, and then looked at the three that didn't perform well. These were the three at the bottom. Energy, haven't seen energy at the bottom in a while. Energy has been on fire, but we did see energy drop a little more than six tenths of 1%, healthcare down about one third of 1%. And industrials, which have been strong along with energy, uh, down about two tenths of 1%. So, a little bit of bifurcation really in the market yesterday, where we see some areas up, some, some areas down. 
It was true on our major indices. It was true across our sectors. It was true across industry groups. It was just a day of sideways action. So really not a whole lot to be taken from uh, uh, Monday's action. We'll see what happens today. I can tell you that futures right now, let me give you those. So the diamonds right now are up about uh, a little less than one-tenth of 1%. Spiders up two-tenths of 1%. The QQQ tracking the NASDAQ 100 up about uh, one-third of 1%. And then the IWM, uh, which tracks the small cap Russell 2000 index, up about two-tenths of 1%. So it looks like you know things hold up for the next 20 minutes. We'll get off to a slightly positive start uh, to the uh, trading today. Um, and we'll see whether or not we can break out of this range that we've been in or that we were in yesterday, maybe start another um, uptrend. The, the uh, NASDAQ 100 is an area to watch because it has now hit that 50-day moving average. So that is certainly going to be an area that where I would like to see a little bit of strength coming in. Or we might just simply, you know, this could turn into sideways consolidation. At our event last night, we uh, uh, had an educational event talking about price support and resistance. Um, seems pretty basic, but it's really important that you understand where key support lies. And one of the questions I was asked last night at the end was, what does the support look like on the QQQ? Of course, the QQQ tracks the NASDAQ 100. So I will pull up the NASDAQ 100 and I'll annotate quickly uh, what I was looking at yesterday. Um, first, I think it's pretty clear that we have support right at about that level, maybe just maybe right up in there. So I'm going to say somewhere around 17,800 on the NDX. And we finished at 18,1. So we got about 300 points down to where I think we've got some pretty good support. And that was after the gap up. If you notice, after we gapped up back in mid February, <clears throat> excuse me, we went back down. We hit a low. I'll, show, I'll go over that in a minute. Um, but we hit a low somewhere around that 17.8 area. And if you look at uh, subsequent candlesticks, um, we had some other days where we went down almost exactly to that level. So looking back over the last almost two months, probably about seven weeks or so, this is a level that we've gone down and tested now multiple times, but we haven't broken through. So in the very near term support, you can have you know near term support, you can have intraday support, um, you could have intermediate support, you can have long term support. You know you, you got to depending on what kind of <clears throat> excuse me what kind of trader you are, I think that should help to dictate which support and which chart, what time frame you're looking at. So here on the Nasdaq 100, this is what I would consider more of a short term. Support level. It's not like if we go below 17.8, oh my gosh, the bull market's ended. Not saying that at all. But in the short term, we have been holding this level. So I think this is the first key area of price support. And if you lose it, you've also lost the 50 day and the 20 day. So it's just starting to paint a picture that at least in the near term, you got to be careful and maybe we're going to see some lower prices. I would say more intermediate term, that price support would be on this breakout. Because when you look at, um, you know, if you look at uh, different areas of the market or, or different time periods of the market, when you move up and then you um, go sideways for a while and then you move back up and you break out, let me probably should have been doing this a while ago so you could see this a little bit better. Um, but anyway, when you make a high, you pull back at that 20 day and then you go up and make another high, that's that prior resistance, once it's broken, becomes support. And so when you go through that level, you come back down. We didn't quite test it, but we went almost right to it before we turned back up, got to resistance. Here was our resistance we established, pulled back, hit the 20 day, and then we set a new high. Well, we haven't gone back and tested this yet. So if I go back here for a second. Get rid of that support level. And let's just keep that. But let's again zero in over here. So you break above 17,000. We went back, we tested, I don't know, maybe 17,150. 
here. We got back down to about 17.3, but we've never really tested that level. So if this were to morph into, let's say the CPI number on Wednesday is higher than expected, maybe it comes at four tenths of 1%, and we get a big sell off and we lose this 17.8 level. To me, there are two key areas. One would be your gap support. And if we lose gap support, I really don't see anything significant until we're all the way down to the 17,000 level. And so for those looking for a little bit more weakness to really kind of unwind that November to March rally, I would think 17,000. That would be about 9%, not quite a correction, but it would be pretty close to a correction, which is typically defined as a 10% move to the downside from the high. So we wouldn't quite be there. We'd be, we'd be pretty close. I don't think we go down there. I just don't think we're going to see that much weakness as we head toward earnings. Uh, that would not be typical, not to say it couldn't happen. But historically, we tend to actually do well heading into earnings season. So my feeling is that we're probably going to move to the upside. Of course, again, we got to get through these inflation reports first. And I don't know how they're going to come out. I do think if they come in hotter than expected, we'll probably at least test that 17.8 level, if not break through it. Um, but I don't know. I don't have the reading. I don't know what it, how it's going to come in. So we'll kind of just play it by ear and, and see how, it, how the market develops. Um, I can tell you that whether it breaks down or not is not going to change my opinion on the longer term uh, belief that we go higher. Um, it, to me, it would probably be a quick move down. I think a quick move back up. Um, and I think probably by May, we would be back at or near all-time highs. That's kind of what I think, but we'll see how it plays out. If we hold 17.8, uh, there's probably no doubt that we're going to be back up testing those new all-time highs probably sooner rather than later. I and mean, if the CPI report comes in tomorrow, two-tenths rise instead of three-tenths, you could see the all-time high tomorrow. Wouldn't shock me either. So, you know, this report could certainly uh, trigger a big sell-off, but it could also trigger another rally to new highs. So I know that probably isn't helping anyone. It could go higher, could go lower. But in the short term, that's reality. I mean, again, I try to follow where the key levels are, where I would say, hey, maybe we're going to have more problems. To me, that big level would be down closer to 17,000. And if we get out of this and look at the weekly chart, um, well, 17,000 would be, would be below the 20. Um, it would also, let's see, what were the highs over here? 16,764 are the highs there. We came back uh, to 16,2 there. So that was a high that was just beneath. Or not, actually, no, that was just above this one. That high got up as high as 16,969. So that breakout right there is right around that 17,000 level, maybe just below. And so 20 week moving average is currently at 17,393. And then you've got pretty good support right around that 17,000 level. So those are the two key areas for me that uh, I would be watching. But that 17,393 on the weekly 20, that 20 uh, week moving average, we go back to the daily and we look at that gap support, that's at 17. 478. So that's within 100 points, which is really nothing on the NASDAQ 100 at this point. So probably if we break below, I could see maybe a 20 week test, which would also line up pretty close with this gap support. Um, I did say I was going to give you the, the near term support. So I wanted to look at this. So there's 17,808 on the low, 17,840. 17,804, that is March 5th, and 17,764 is March 15th, and then 17,809 is March 19th. So you can see there were a number of days right in here where we were down close to 17,8, and we had the one day where we dipped just a little bit below it, 35 points below it. So I think 17,8's definitely a level to keep an eye on if we do see um, additional selling. All right, spent a lot of time on that, but I did want to kind of go over some of the things we talked about with price support last night. Um, IWM in a trading range. Um, I'm kind of watching this trend line. 
Um, I would say maybe 202 is probably pretty close to where that trend line comes in, 202, 202 and a half. You got the 50-day moving average right now, 201.62. So that's clearly an area that we want to watch to the downside. Um, if we hold it, then we're looking at maybe about 210, almost 211 um, to the upside. So trading range for the IWM. Transportation, still, we've got this top up here at about 16.2, just slightly above it. We got the bottoms coming in at 16.4, and then probably the biggest level at 16.2. Those would be your two support areas. We're trying to hold on to this, these moving averages and move higher. Um, if we break definitively below the 20 and the 50, to me, that just tells us we remain in this trendless environment. If you believe that, hey, we're going to make this breakout in April, we're going higher, you really want to see this area hold on transports and go back up and take out this triple top. That would go a long way toward sending the market back up toward if not into record high territory. All right, let's take a look at the VIX because the VIX made a big move. Um, you have to understand how the VIX works in a secular bull market. It is not unusual to get spikes up to the 17, maybe even to 20, but usually 17. And then we kind of back off here. We got up to 18 intraday, but we closed below 16. All of these days, well, we had two or three days. We went through 16 in here held below it though on the close. And then finally last Thursday, we closed above 16 after almost reaching 17. And then in two days, we haven't really seen a lot of buying. I mean, it would be just kind of been stabilizing a little bit. And look at the VIX dropping again. I mean, if the bears want to take control, I think tomorrow is going to be their opportunity. You want to see a higher than expected CPI number? You want to see a big gap down. You want to see this VIX spike. And then you want to see the VIX hold 17 on the close. That to me would give it an opportunity, at least in the short term, to maybe go down and hit some of those support levels I was talking about in the, in the uh, market. But I mean, we're not far on the S&P 500 from an all-time high. And yet the VIX has gone from 12 and a half got up to 17. Moving up 50% on the VIX when it's below 20 is not the same as moving 50% up on the VIX when it's above 20. I mean, this wasn't 50%, but it was, well, pretty close, 15 and a half up to 23. Yeah, basically it was about 50% move. But do you remember the selling that was taking place back in October at the bottom of that um, correction? It started escalating in October to the downside, the S&P 500, right here. I mean, that was a pretty big drop. That was with the VIX going up 50% and through 20, as opposed to what happens to the S&P 500 when the VIX goes up 50% when we're below 20. It's not the same. This is going to be more panic. This is still contained. I mean, the VIX at... 15 or 16 is not outrageously high over history. If you look at a long-term chart of the VIX, when the VIX gets above 20, that's when you got to be really on your toes as a trader, because we might just be testing 20 with a big sell-off. And then, you know, you say, well, I'm going to protect myself and get out. And the next thing you know, the VIX is back to 15 and you, you got out on the bottom as the market takes back off again, really gets tricky with the volatility index up around 20, which is why I always say, I would much rather trade a market with a VIX at 12 than with a VIX at 30 or 40. Some people love that volatility. I hate volatility. I think most successful traders would tell you they don't like high volatility markets. You can make a lot of money, but you can lose a lot of money in a hurry. Don't like it. I can manage my risks so much better in a low volatility index um, type of market. So anyway, just kind of wanted to point that out. Yes, VIX has been going up, but it's below 20. If we get that VIX really you know, pumping and we go through 20, that's when you're probably going to see much, much bigger sell-off in the S&P 500. So for now, it's just consolidation to me. 
All right. For those of you who are new to Earnings Beats, we'd love to have you join us on our free Earnings Beats Digest newsletter. Name and email address all it takes. We issue this newsletter three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And if you're thinking, oh, I already get so many newsletters, I don't have time. This isn't really a newsletter. It's a chart in two paragraphs. So if you spend more than five minutes on it, you're focusing on something because you should have read it, seen the chart and be done in five minutes tops. But it just gives you some idea of how we approach the market. Some of the things we look at, I think it would be very educational for someone who is, is learning the market. And I think even those of you that may be great traders, I think you might pick up a little something from uh, the way we look at the market from time to time. So I think it's a great uh, newsletter and anybody in that community, when we have our free events, like we had last night on um, price volume and last week on candlesticks, we reach out to our free EV Digest community and invite them, give them room links. So there is another reason to be a EV Digest subscriber. So please check that out. All right, let's take a look at a couple of stocks. Market's going to open in about three minutes. So first, now I can tell you I own the stock. Um, so I'm not just giving you a stock that I don't like. I, I do like it. I am in a, a half position. If we go back to the bottom of this triangle, I will be in the other half. That's my strategy at this point. But I love this symmetrical triangle that's formed after this uptrend. I believe the stock goes higher. It's one of our portfolio stocks. It was already one of the stocks we liked a lot. AD line continues to be strong. If you look at the relative strength now versus software, it was going down there for about a month and a half. Recently just broke that downtrend line. And software has just kind of been meandering. Uh, when I say that, it just, for the last month or so, just going sideways relative to the S&P 500. But if we get into another move on the NASDAQ to the upside, this is an area of the market that tends to lead. Software tends to do extremely well. In my opinion, ServiceNow remains one of the leaders. It's in a very bullish pattern. There appears to be accumulation. A lot of things to like here. So I wanted to point this one out. Is it breaking out? I mean, it depends on how you draw your lines. That's the thing with any kind, anything that uh, involves trend lines, channel. You're really, you know, at the mercy of the person that's drawing the lines. Some like to draw lines connecting intraday tops. Some like to draw lines connecting candle bodies. That's me. It just depends. And even just being off a little bit, if I just tilt the this top, top line just a little bit, then it would be like, nope, we're right up against resistance. The way I drew it yesterday looks like we may have made a slight breakout. I don't know that I'd be running, you know, uh, celebrating just yet. Um, I'd like to see that volume really pick up. That was not there yesterday. It's just kind of average. So get some volume, get up over 800, and then I'm going to start getting more excited on a stock like now. Um, another stock I gave to our members at Earnings Beats last week is Net. Um, didn't have this one annotated. This was not in the Fab Five, by the way. This was one I talked about last week. But there was your big earnings gap. Here was the bottom of gap support. Came all the way back down, essentially. I think we got within about 80 cents after being $25 above Gap support, we worked our way all the way back down to less than a dollar away from that gap support. And like I mentioned yesterday in the session last night, price support, when you get corroborating uh, signals. So here you're not only testing this gap support, but look at the 50 day moving average coming up from underneath. So I don't know if this is starting the rise. I think a break above 100 would be very bullish. This is another one I have partial position in. If it goes back down to around 90, 90 and a half, I'm going to be in a full position. But right here, um, I think net looks pretty solid, but we need that move to confirm that next uptrend. Um, Tilray wanted to mention they came out with their earnings. Let me give you the latest on it just uh, to see. Um, it's down 40 cents. It's down 15%. And then NEOG um, down almost 10%. These were two companies that reported earnings earlier uh, today um, and uh, both down considerably at the open. You can see Neogen's chart though, uh, really just pointing down, looked horrible going into earnings and uh, didn't get very good news, I guess. I didn't see the, the actual numbers, EPS revenues or anything, just simply looking at the reaction. 
Um, so anyway, those were two uh, stocks that I wanted to just point out. Um, earnings will be picking up, by the way. So right after we get past inflation reports on uh, Wednesday and Thursday, we've got earnings kicking off uh, on Friday. The banks, some of the big banks, we got JP Morgan, we got Wells Fargo, we got Citigroup, um, we got um, BlackRock. Um, seems like there's another one in there somewhere. There's like five or six companies, big companies, multi, you know, like hundreds of billions of dollars in market cap. Um, so we're going to get the first um, word from these companies and let's see how the market reacts, especially with these banks. Um, they're going to tell you a little bit about what's going on with interest rates as well. And with that coming right after the inflation reports, some of the things coming out of uh, those big banks are going to be important. I can tell you, Jamie Dimon, though, he tends to be really bearish. I don't know if ever, anybody else notices this. I expect him to say, you know, difficult environment. Uh, don't know when rates are going to be cut. Still, you know, inflation still out there. Expect some of that. But I have a feeling you're going to see a really strong report out of JP Morgan, perhaps uh, uh, Citigroup as well, maybe even Wells Fargo. Those three, if they come through, certainly would give a lift to that banking group. All right, that's it for me. I appreciate everybody tuning in today. Again, hit that like button, uh, subscribe to our channel. Uh, we're certainly growing. We appreciate you being part of our community and helping us out with those likes and subscribes. It definitely does make a difference for it and for us, and we appreciate you. Have a great day, everybody. Happy trading.